as Taylor said, I'm Spencer Robinson. Uh, a lot of the knowledge that is going into packing this presentation actually came a lot from my job at the IT Innovation Lab at UNO. Uh, it was essentially our job to always take the latest technologies and figure out why those were better, what the value was for the advancement. And that also included uh, programming languages. So I ended up becoming familiar with a really diverse set, and so we'll get into all of that today. So we'll start out with what we're leaving behind, kind of where programming started out when, or web development started out when it was first created. Uh, it was mostly just static web pages. So if you guys have heard of HTML and CSS, um, it's essentially just those. So all the pages always stay the same. You hard code everything in. Uh, you can use a little bit of JavaScript on the back to make the flow work a little better. But in the end, all the content is going to always be the same and nothing's going to be changing. Um, if this applies to any of the uh, projects that you guys are working on and you are only using CSS, for the love of God, please get Bootstrap. It'll make your life a thousand times easier and you can style things way faster and uh, get your project launched. So I found a good example of a static website um, that shows that you can still make really good websites even if they are static. So as you can see, they've got some cool animations. It's interesting and it shows a lot of good parts about their business. Uh, you immediately can see that they put a lot of thought and style into what they do. Um, and as you'll notice, when I click on the different <laughs> navigation, up in the top left on the tab, you can see that it's loading every time. And so that's an important theme that we're going to pay attention to as we progress. So moving on from that, we got a little bit more advanced. And we got into what I call Dynamic 1.0. So this is when uh, people started putting databases behind their websites. And with that, they were able to use their data to kind of cater the experience for people. So the content is changing, and uh, the views can be adjusted based on w what type of user that is and things like that. Um, so some frameworks that I've used in the past that I really like for this level are CakePHP and Django. CakePHP is, as you can guess, a PHP framework, um, and Django is Python. Um, so here, for this example, we're going to step over into the fine dining scene with our Taco Bell website. Um, so as you can see, uh, Taco Bell is going to be one of those places where their menu items are changing a lot, and so they're going to need to be changing their content quite often. So good examples of these style of websites are ones that need an admin page on the background. So as they get a new menu, they can just add in those items. And then this view will just populate all those different pieces uh, as the data is changing. Does anybody have any questions about that? And we're going to keep it pretty casual. So I know that this is like a ton of content. So if you have any questions when we hit something, just let me know and I'll answer it. And they could change that by time of day as well. Yep, they could change it by time of day and uh, all kinds of different things. So this is really where the possibilities become kind of endless because you can feed whatever data you want into the background and bring it in. Uh, but one thing to notice is as I'm clicking these links, we are still getting page loading in the background. And so that will bring us to what I see as the future of uh, web development. Um, I call it kind of dynamic 2.0, um, but the rest of the world usually calls it reactive. So this has a lot of the same things from 1.0, where you have a data source in the background, you're doing interactions, and the pages can change based on who's using them or what data they're trying to see. But what the really huge value is are the single load system. And so for these ones, you load the website once, and then you're never going to see that spinning wheel again. And so the way that that works, uh, we'll get into it in a second. But uh, essentially, you set up your website so that it's in all these different small modular chunks. 
And if you do it properly, you should be able to basically just copy and paste that chunk wherever you want in your website, and it can just pull it in and take it out whenever it needs to. So it comes to a whole new level of efficiency and lets you take your user experience to a much different place because instead of having to redirect users all the time, you can keep them on the same page and just bring in the forms or the content that they need without moving them around. So our example for that one brings us to the Las Vegas Bellagio. Um, so as we click on things, uh, you'll notice that on some of the bigger websites, they still do have loading. And uh, that's just kind of how you can separate the modules. Uh, they have one page in here. Uh, so as you'll notice, as I change filters, instead of reloading, you just see that spinning wheel. And that's when it's dynamically changing the content. And uh, so to explain a little better what's going on behind the scenes, I have this diagram. So uh, we start out at the bottom with the views. So that's the piece where the user is seeing it, and that's what they interact with. And uh, with the reactive websites, it's constantly going up to the controllers and working with the models to keep bringing in the content and making the adjustments that it needs but it doesn't need the page reload to make those events happen. It can just keep going on in the background. And then I believe the first thing to start um, doing this style of interaction with the database were Ajax, uh, if any of you are familiar with those. Um, so essentially what that means is uh, on that server side piece we have up top, that stack can be really whatever API you want. So for example, on an app that I'm working on right now, I have it with the Django API stack working with a SQL Lite server, or a SQL Lite database. And so the important thing to know there is that essentially the system can make these HTTP requests and pull in the data without doing the page reload. And so every time a user is doing a request, it can go ahead and grab it and pull it through. And uh, it's also where we took a step into asynchronous programming so that if you do a call, then you don't have to wait for that to finish before you can do something else. So you can do these calls and they'll run in the background while you're working on other things and then they'll eventually go through even if you're on a completely different page. So the available technologies for that today, um, the one that I work with a lot is Angular. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with Ionic. Ionic is an app development framework built with Angular so that you can build once and deploy on Android, iOS, Windows, and the web. And so it's really nice if you're a startup and you want to just get something thrown up and get it out to your customers. They make it look really professional really easily and you can put together some really complex things. Firebase, you'll see up there right next to Firestore. And those are kind of the next generation of databases. I know that Taylor's a huge fan of those um, because they have a lot of pre-built for you. So if you want your user authentication, it's already ready to go and you basically just have to attach it into your website. Um, one other thing that's really good about that is it monitors the changes to the database so that um, once I send some data, if it changes the database, then it'll push all those changes out to all the other web apps that are available. And so they're really good for chat apps and things like that because you can send out the push notifications automatically and things along those lines. Um, React and Vue are just other kind of angular alternatives, maybe a little more focus on the front end. Um, MongoDB is kind of the background of Firebase where it's just an unstructured, what they call dictionary-based database. So um, MongoDB is really great for if you aren't sure what your data is going to look like. Um, because you can tell it where to store it and it'll just take it and as long as it's a JSON it's going to save it. So you can just get a big list of data and search through it eventually as long as structure isn't very important to you. Uh, and then Elasticsearch is 
another dictionary-based alternative. Uh, and the way that they index the data makes it so that you can do complex queries super, super fast. So if you're working with really large data sets, then um, that's the one for you. Uh, so essentially, you get the idea. There's tons of technologies. Uh, I have three JavaScript frameworks on there right now. And there's probably five more JavaScript frameworks since I started this talk. So just find whichever front end that you like. And um, if you look up reactive web development languages, then you'll find plenty of options. And just give it a shot. Um, so now we'll go into the best choice for you or your business. If you, because what's important is that even though the other technologies I think we're kind of moving away from, there's still a lot of value in those different alternatives. So for example, if you're doing an informative website, it only needs to be a static website. There's no reason to have all this complex background if you're just going to be showing static pages anyway. Um, so for these, I recommend website builders. WordPress is good. Uh, they have a lot of different plugins you can get. I just used Wix for the first time this weekend, and I was really, really impressed with that. You can essentially answer a bunch of questions, and they build a very polished website for you. Um, and then Google Sites is another one that I know a lot of people recommend. If you're doing basic interactive, then really you can just choose a framework. <laughs> um, a lot of web development, there's a thousand ways to do it. So if you find one that you like the features for it, then uh, that's going to be what's right for you. Uh, for example, Cake PHP is really great for prototyping because you essentially just set up a database schema and then it'll build your add, edit, index, and uh, delete views for all of your different database tables and set up a basic working site just out of the box. And then you just have to personalize from there. Uh, Laravel is pretty similar. Django is the Python framework. It is really great for APIs. You can do um, JavaScript web tokens really easily. And uh, the way that they do serializers in the background makes it so that you can essentially design your user experience in the back end before you're even passing it to your front web app. Uh, and then, of course, Angular um, and all of those other alternatives that we talked about before. If you're going to build an app, the easiest stack that I have found right now is Ionic and Firebase. They are very well developed to be coupled together. And um, like I said, Firebase comes with a lot of things that make the interaction look very professional and bring in some really advanced features. If you're working with large data, I recommend Elasticsearch just because it's able to do the complex querying so quickly. And it's really great at finding relationships in data. Um, it also comes with a dashboard making tool called Kibana. And uh, so it'll just take all the data that you have in your Elasticsearch database and let you build visualizations that look really good and can be live time. Uh, for unstructured data, as I discussed before, is MongoDB. So if you're going to be doing things like web crawling, or um, just going through social media content and you really don't know what kind of data you're going to get on the other end, MongoDB will still be able to take care of all of it for you and um, save it for whatever you need it for. So uh, that's a lot of information. So if you guys have any questions or even anything specific to your situation that you'd like recommendations on, I can try my best. Um, so I'll open it up for you guys now. You said you prefer um, Ionic. Is there a particular reason why you prefer it? Uh, I mean, it's, I haven't found anything that it's anywhere remotely close to as easy to develop an uh, app with. Like I've done Android Studio, and uh, I haven't worked on the iOS side, but Ionic, just being able to build it once and then ha be able to release it on both sides. And it also styles it individually for Android and iOS so that it's meeting those style requirements that both app stores require. Um, it's just really, really nice. And uh, like I said, with Firebase, you can put in a back end in like five minutes. And 
as long as you're defining your models in Ionic properly, then it's almost automatic that you're saving your data. And so it just works out really well. It's uh, the people that develop it do a really good job, and they do automatic page generation. So lazy loading is uh, already built in. And for you, those of you that don't know what lazy loading is, so essentially that um, like a lot of websites, if you pull it up, then it'll download big chunks of it. And that's what the big problem with Angular was in the beginning, is it was able to swap in your different views, but it also downloaded all your views in the beginning, and people don't necessarily use all of them. So lazy loading brought in the idea where you can load the website, and it'll bring in the view that you asked for, and then it won't worry about the other ones until the user requests it. And Ionic has that auto automatically now, and so that's really nice. It keeps the processing low or lower on uh, phones and things like that. So, uh, what kind of build tools is Ionic? Um, I believe it's just Angular in the background, and it uses Cordova to compile it down. Um, and so Cordova is actually also another really good thing to look into. If you already have a website that's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript based then you can run it through Cordova and launch it on Android and iOS automatically. So Cordova is a big part of why a a Ionic is so good. <laughs> it used to be PhoneGap. Have you ever heard of that? Like five years ago. Cordova was? Cordova was retitled. PhoneGap was running Cordova. Yeah. Just to load it once. When it all loads at once, does it doesn't it not load everything then and load slower? Right. So that's what we're talking about with the lazy loading. Okay. Where okay, so just to answer that, yeah. Yeah. Where you you can just pull. It just grabs exactly what you need, and then, um, like if you say I need to add a menu item, it'll bring in that form. But since that's such a small chunk, then it can do it super fast. Okay. And so doing the loading actually takes tons longer. Um, and uh, since it's just dynamically bringing in small, small pieces at a time, then it can do it really, really quickly. Yeah. I've heard recently that uh, React is a very unopinionated uh, development environment, uh, mm -hmm. meaning it puts a lot of responsibility on the development teams to provide additional structure, but it gives them it gives them assistance, considerable assistance, while at the same time giving them some of the freedom that they relish. So uh, and the combination of, of React with TypeScript, which is JavaScript but typed. Right. Uh, which fills one of the big weaknesses in JavaScript, uh, it is a particularly valuable combination. Does mm. that strike a chord? Um, I can't speak too much to React. I haven't used that one in particular, but I just know that it's a really big one in the space. Um, the TypeScript, as you said, is a really great addition. That's what the latest versions of Angular are in now, and it's a very obvious um, step up. Um, but as far as React goes, I couldn't tell you, unfortunately. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thanks. <laughs>